Now, when I was in Fallujah, my civil affairs team was attached for a time to the Gulf Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, and we were responsible for the blockade positions on the western side of the city of Fallujah. The Fallujah, uh, the siege of the city, which was precipitated by the incident with the Blackwater security agents who drove across the southern bridge across the Euphrates and were immediately ambushed, killed, and had their bodies uh, sprung up and burned on the northern bridge. While we were there, one of the squads of, of Golf Company got pinned down in a firefight to the west of the city. Lance Corporal Frank got shot through the armpit hole in his flak jacket. The bullet entered his side and lodged near his spine, and it severed an artery. My team was called to help with this medevac to get him to the operating tent at Camp Takata, the main logistics base. And I got in my Humvee with my team, with bullets bouncing off the door at times. We drove to the point where, this, uh, where we could pick up this Marine where the squad was pinned down. We got him loaded into the Humvee in front of me. We hauled butt through places where we would have been scared to go with a full convoy of six Humvees with machine guns, and yet we had only three. And we, we, we went through IED Alley and all the hot spots between Camp Takata and the city of Fallujah, and we fishtailed through all the turns coming into the base. And we got there, and the Marines in that Humvee that were ready to load him out, the, uh, the, the corpsman was there frantically trying to save this Marine's life. And of all the equipment problems in Iraq, the stretcher that this Marine was on was folding in the middle. It wouldn't even stay up, so it took four people to carry him instead of two. And I ended up on his left side in the middle of the stretcher as we carried him into the surgical tent. And he was moaning and, and writhing in pain. And then he flailed his arm off next to me. And I put it back on and I told him, don't worry, you made it. Everything's going to be okay. We got you here. Because nobody knew what else to say in that situation. I didn't know. It was the best I could muster. Make him feel better. We got him into the surgical tent, got the call for a resupply mission, and on our way back we saw a mortuary truck passing us in the other direction, and we all knew what had happened. Marine bled out internally. And after that happened, the doctor came out of the surgical tent and yelled, Effing Corman. And it wasn't until I came home and was able to get a little emotional perspective on my experience that I realized the significance of this. For all the problems facing this country, for everything we see manifest that we talk about in politics today, it's all superficial. This country is bleeding out internally. And we're making excuses. And we're trying to tell each other it's just going to be okay. You can just cast a vote and go back to sleep. You can blame someone else when things go wrong. But that's not the case. We are bleeding out internally. And the single greatest problem facing this country is that there's not enough love. And what we're here to do is put the love back in revolution. Now, we all swore an oath, those of us in the military, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I don't think that the, the Constitution is anything sacred. It's certainly not perfect. But the principles behind it are. And the Constitution can serve as a guiding light to freedom for this country, to return it to the vision that our founders laid out for us, to once again be a vision for the world and an example of freedom. But some of us found out the hard way that the greatest enemies of the Constitution are not to be found in the sands of some far off land, but rather right here at home. Now, although we are, as of this moment, in the exploratory phase, we, we do have some new business cards for this campaign. And on the back of every single one of them is a quote from President John F. Kennedy that has been ringing particularly true for me lately. 
A revolution is coming. A revolution which will be peaceful if we are wise enough, compassionate if we care enough, successful if we are fortunate enough, but a revolution which is coming whether we will it or not. We can affect its character. We cannot alter its inevitability. The revolution of which we speak, the revolution of hearts and minds in the United States, is part of the inevitable progress of humanity towards a society based on greater love, faith, and respect between fellow human beings in which there is no force, violence, or coercion in any human interactions. That is the side we are on, and that is what we are fighting for. Those of us who know more have a greater responsibility. Those of us who know the current injustices of the state have a greater responsibility to do something about it. We have a foreign policy that is unconstitutional, that we cannot afford, that is putting us into a debt that we are passing on to our children. We have a monetary policy that exists exclusively for the unnatural concentration of wealth and power. We have a system of corporatism that exists at the expense of small businesses, to the discouragement of entrepreneurs and at the expense and complete disregard for individual economic rights. We have a drug war. We have a system through the FDA that would posit that our government can tell us what we put in our own bodies, that we as human beings do not enjoy the fundamental right to make that decision for ourselves. We have a complete disregard by our government for the civil liberties, the simple ones that are laid out in the Constitution, of which all of them as well, at least our elected officials, swore an oath to support and defend. Now, like I said, we have all the right people in the room, and I'd like to ask for a second that anybody here who's been arrested for their activism stand up, please. freedom of speech in this country. Just wait until you try exercising it in the wrong place at the wrong time and you'll find out otherwise, as some of us have. But what's worse, in having a government that behaves like it owns us rather than serves us, to me the most egregious offense today is the federal income tax. As long as our government has access to a fiat currency system where they can conjure money out of thin air not only is the federal income tax entirely unnecessary, but nothing more than a means to oppress and enslave us. I, for one, refuse to be so enslaved. In the winter of 1776, Thomas Paine said, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. And so began the great American tradition of winter soldiering. And I have decided that for myself, the greatest way that I can continue that tradition is to run for Congress to represent the New Mexico's 3rd District in the United States House of Representatives. With your support, with the support of this movement, I will be that voice of freedom, I will be that winter soldier, and I will be your representative in Washington, D.C. Now, for those of you that stand by me, as I said, we will be labeled rebels, traitors, and enemies of the state, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I love my country. It's my government that I'm afraid of. But as a movement, we go forth into a violence-based system with a plea for peace, we go into the darkness with the torch of liberty, and together we go onward to revolution. Now, 